for one, thanks for stepping in at the last minute. If you haven't ever done that before, sometimes it can be a little stressful. So at the last minute, I asked Ajay to talk a little bit about the research. But a few things about Kansas State. Ajay's been there how many years now? Ten years. So that's great. He's a full professor, but one of the unique things he's really been able to do is to work with industry and has an, had an impact with several companies on some of the technology that – that uh, we see here in the state of Ohio. And so he's come, and in, in the morning, he's going to talk about planters. Come on up, Ajay. And then uh, in this afternoon, we'll get into some of this targeted spraying. But uh, just to kind of highlight, at Kansas State, they're committed. they got a really strong team, and they're not only working from robotics to drone applications. They're doing some cool stuff with thermal cameras in particular that I, I track, but he's also working on sprayers and planters. So a pretty wide range of technologies that there were. They've got an institute now at Kansas State that is dedicated to bring faculty members and students together to work on a lot of facets of, of precision ag. So with that, are we ready to go, Jason? Trying to get everything set up here. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ajay. I'll let him do a little bit additional uh, introduction to himself, but we really appreciate you being here and stepping in. So thank you. Thank you, John. Morning, everyone. How was the last session? Good? Okay. Well, um, like John said, I'm AJ Sharda. I'm a professor at K-State um, 10 years uh, before coming to K-State. Uh, I did my PhD with John Fulton uh, at Auburn. So he missed that part telling you. Um, but it was a fun time back in Auburn. <clears throat> we did a lot of different stuff around sprayers, planters, you know, fertilizer spreaders and all that stuff. Uh, I spent a year and a half at the Washington State University uh, in the Northwest. Uh, there's a center for precision and automated agricultural systems. We do a lot of uh, robotic things for automation things for tree food. So it was a fun time there. So 10 years at K-State, um, we, you know, we, we started, uh, we'll talk about planter stuff here. Uh, John has talked about some of our other, you know, uh, portfolios in terms of what we do in terms of research. Um, from a planning standpoint, we have been doing some on-farm research uh, since 2014. Uh, we started working with a company called Hosh. Um, it used to have a little base uh, in Harper, Kansas, and... Um, we, we we did some work for two three four years and then uh, we moved on to uh, to work with you know uh, deer systems and all that. Uh, in last many years, we have been very fortunate to work with uh, pretty much all brands of planters which are out in the market. So it's been uh, it's really been a blessing and you know a good opportunity to look at these systems with with how they do compared to each other as well. Um, to give you a quick uh, kind of background on what we do, um, most of our research in the last years has been all on farm. Uh, we barely do anything which is uh, small plot and all that stuff. Uh, it's partly uh, part of our research is, uh, you know, is around, uh, you know, validation verification stuff. Uh, and lately, more and more work is around new system, kind of a not development, but as the things are, and more more requests or more questions are coming in terms of what new technology should look like how how do new autonomous you know not autonomous but how can we become uh, make systems more automated for our operators um something john used to talk about a lot we have really taken it to the essence is that you know we're worried we, we are very focused on what these systems do for the operator in terms of what their intended operation is, right? That's what we expect when I spend half a million dollar on equipment uh, and expect that something to do. Is that everybody wants that or not? Yes, yeah. Uh, and the number two is uh, is what is available to the customer or an operator when, when you are sitting in the cab. What can you know or what do you know about those systems and how well uh, aware are you in terms of making some adjustments real time? Right, because once you're done planting, um, I don't know how many opportunities or chances you have to go back and fill in some of the things. You know, whether there are gaps or equipment uh, errors and all that stuff. So, so that's <clears throat> that's where we are from a from a farmer or the uh, from on farm standpoint. Um, we we do not have uh, any land on on campus, but we work with uh, three or four farmers uh, in and around campus. We typically stay in like 60ish mile range. 
uh, with all the logistics of moving stuff, you know, equipment and people and, and taking all that data. So um, <clears throat> to, with this background, I really want to thank uh, some of our farmers who are very open to helping us with land. You know, we have you know, it's 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 a fun funny story. And when we started working in the first year, we used to get the most crappy fields in the in the farmers' portfolio, right? You know, with all the wild garlic, wild onions, you know, stones, brand new land you're bought. You don't want to mess with anything. So that's where we started. Uh, but it's a fun time that we are in a situation where we, you know what we do. I also want to you know, it's a good practice. What you know, just to just to share, we bring our two or three farmers. They combined you know, operate somewhere in the range of 100, 10, 120,000 acres. Uh, we lay out requests on what we want to do this season. And then, you know, they, they say, the, what are the fields you want? Irrigated, dry land, you know, whatever the requirement is. So that has been, you know, um, uh, our journey, number one. And to, uh, to be in a spot to have access to those fields is just, just fabulous. So uh, with this background, I really want to thank, uh, you know, a lot of people. So this week, um, I'm going to talk um, a very little about what we did most of the work i'm going to talk about is from 2023 season right um we did some work on downforce optimization um people have people are working with planters actively in this room Can i have some hands okay most of the people do have you know electric seed meters yeah and some sort of a downforce hydraulic pretty much right so so i'll talk a little bit about that we did some work on you know, use of farming wheels, do we need or not? What is the value they bring? Uh, something about closing systems, what are the different types? You know, how much, go how good they are? Uh, something about row cleaners as well. You know, where should we go with that? You know, are they doing a good job or not? Um, something about uh, the quality of trench and how much trash we leave and, you know, something about the closing quality of the system as well. Like how good of a seed to soil contact we can, we get and, you know, all that stuff. Um, and then some other things. So, what I'll talk mostly about the downforce optimization thing. We really want to bring some sort of a, you know, automation on the background ground. So, so how do we set downforce these days? Do we have everything automated? Pretty much, yeah. Anybody? You should, right? So we we, we start with some number. Uh, I don't know where you guys are. We so from a soil standpoint, we are in the kind of a medium, like you know, clay loam, sandy loam soils. We are. And from, from all these years, what we have come across is that if you, we, we try to get some numbers out to people, right? Um, and it all, I will also say that it does depend to some extent in terms of what system you are using. You know, you're using, you know, a green system, a red system and all that stuff. So it does depend somewhat on that. But from a deer standpoint, we started with, you know, some numbers, which deer used to say, hey, this is what you should try. And then we quickly realized that that does not work really well, right? So, so from our area standpoint, we've been think we have been saying that you know where you should start from, and then how do you kind of normalize? So, so this is our kind of a permanent team, and then we were really fortunate to have you know a lot of people who were visiting scholars, engineers, and all that stuff. So, um, really want to thank you know there was no way we could have finished uh, the kind of work we did you know without their support. Um, and before I uh, head out and talk about you know the things. Uh, you know, ID3A Institute for Digital Ag and Advanced Analytics. Uh, we have we have six directors in them. Uh, and myself and you know, a faculty from computer science, a faculty from agronomy, entomology, geography, geosciences, statistical statistics, and machine learning. Right. Um, so so we have a very wide, very interdisciplinary team. Uh, we wanted this institute to be uh, to be interdisciplinary and like a participatory rather than having one director. So really, really happy, really excited about it. Um, we really want to expand and make that institute as a go-to thing for people like us, right? You want to talk to someone at the institute, you whether they are, you know, commodity groups, you know, you know I don't know, Farm Bureau, whatever the case might be. So, you know, from a research standpoint, knowledge dissemination standpoint, engaged en engagement standpoint, and we really want to expand the the engagement from the faculty from different disciplines, right? To just make anybody's and everybody's work more holistic and kind of a global rather than focused on something which you know which the faculty used to do. So, so with this thing in mind, um, um, talking a little bit about the optimization planet downforce thing uh, from what we do. So uh, in in the last uh, couple of years, we have been we've been looking at 
you know, what kind of margins, right? So you're going to start with a term called margin. Everybody understands margin, right? We set some sort of a, you know, target margin to maintain on my, on my gauge wheels. And then I really want my planter to maintain uh, seating depth, seed spacing consistently, irrespective of speed and all that. Is that fair statement? That's what the expectation is, right? Um, for a few years, um, we, we started with something called 100, you know, and, you know, 120 and 220. We just took some numbers, you know, and, and there's some history to it, you know, why those numbers were picked up. And we continue to, you know, move forward, um, you know, in terms of looking at uh, what is the right margin. And something of a question from a lot of producers and also from the manufacturer is that what is the margin where we should stop, right? Because of what? What what might can happen if we put too much margin on it? Compaction is one, right? You know, we can see delayed emergence and all those impacts on yield. You know, obviously, everybody is worried about yield, you know. Uh, so so that is the question was. So um, this year, so whatever we did in many years, it just seems like was not enough. So we have gone overboard this year to kind of a look at, you know, what what we wanted to learn. Uh, we have never planted any field, which is still except one year, one field. So almost all of our studies are no-till. Uh, we have also never planted, this is a question which came in, in one of our other uh, uh, meetings, uh, that we have never planted on in, on wheat residue. It's always been corn, so it's been, you know, rotation. So I don't know, you know, this is what, what we have gotten. Um, so um, from that background, if you see... Um, um, if you see the second line here, um, the the margin treatments. So we we went to from 100, 175, 250, and 325 pounds of margin. You know that's a lot of margin to 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 try to put in, right? So these are 75 pound classes. So again, one of the goal was to look at is 325 pound going to start showing us some sort of a negative or adverse effect on whether it is emergence or yield, right? Uh, and also to see, you know, what we saw in the previous years, can we cap off any loss in depth consistency when we start planting faster, right? That was the other thing. So because the combination of speeds are five, seven and a half and 10 miles, right? So how many people still plan with five miles? All right. <laughs> You know, proud five mile people. Okay, no. Uh, what what the other thing we we continue to say that if you are investing in a technology like this, uh, you have shown this this work for the last seven eight years. Uh, there is absolutely no way that you should be planning at five miles because these systems are capable of giving you exactly what you need at at least seven and a half eight miles. So looking at all the systems like you know I just mentioned all of those systems has somehow the sweet spot around seven and a half, eight miles. You know, you can talk about horse, CNH, you know, white planter, echo, fan this year, and, and deer, right? So all of those systems will give you pretty optimal performance just from what we have seen, right? So four margins, three speeds, um, and then lots of, uh, you know, strips to, to, do, to do all that. So let me uh, also lay out some other things. We, what we do whenever we, we adopt a field like that for a study like that, um, we scout the field. You know, we do not want a lot of terraces and a lot of variability in that, um, but we do want some sort of a, you know, uh, random terrain. We do some soil electrical conductivity. We want to isolate the area so that we are not planting the strips in a very wide variable soil. Make sense? You don't want to put half of the strips in a completely, you know, I don't know silty soils, another one in a complete clay soils and all that stuff. So, so that is our goal to do that. We go out, do all the elevation boundary and all those nice stuff from what, what we want to do. The other thing, what we, the, from this project standpoint, we have gotten enough proof in the last couple of years that not all row units behave the same way. You guys get, see what I'm saying? So what we have done is we have we have divided our planter toolbar into three types of row classifications. We call them wing rows, which are the outer three, four rows on the either side. Good. All non-track rows, which are not following any tire tracks. And then there are track rows, which are following whether, you know, tractor tires. 
could be could everybody got that so with that kind of a row classification we have enough you know kind of a data to see that those rows do not behave consistently across the toolbar right so what we have done so whenever we go to do the, uh, a project like that we lay out all the treatments right in you know, all the combinations of downforce and speed but then we pick out one row from each of these row classifications so one from track one from non track and one from wing to collect all the data post planting good so uh, once we have said or laid down everything um, the other thing what we do um, we, we we are doing something which are completely kind of a systems so we give some information to the engineers something to the agronomists and something for people to kind of go talk about things um, we instrument our planter so every other row has uh, a custom accelerometer we want to really measure what the vertical you know motion of the you know row unit is we we, we on our cell we 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 quantify ride quality ground contact things of that nature right we also instrument our own hydraulic pressure sensor on each or on alternate rows same row which has the uh, accelerometer and i'll tell you why and then we also pull raw data we used to pull can bus data up until 2022 you know, with some of the changes, we could not pull the CAN bus data. Uh, what we are doing is we are we are capturing raw data from the load pins, right? We capture everything at 100 hertz and then downscale. So we have at least a good quality data, not just, you know, the data we are looking at. Now, what we are doing with the hydraulic pressure data is we are calculating something called disk load. You guys heard about something like disk load? Right, so so we talk about margin, right? Uh, we know the dead weight of row unit. We also know what the margin was. We also know what was the hydraulic pressure applied, and we can convert how much additional load was applied on the row unit, right? So by adding the dead weight and additional weight, I know what total weight was available at any given instance. I subtract my margin, and I subtract the the, the soil reaction for closing system, and what I am left with is disk load. Does that make sense? So what we believe is that disk load is probably the most true representation of soil strength in the field, because that is exactly what those disks have taken up to get you the two inch depth you needed. Yes, no, yeah, yeah. Because that's exactly what it is, You that's that's, that's the disc interacting with soil, sharing in and getting in the two inch depth from that standpoint. So once we do that, um, we, our group is pretty diverse. You know, we fight all the time. We fight on small things, what should be done and what should not be done. You know, how should we do this and all that. I think uh, we were done fighting last year and we thought, okay, this year we're gonna go twice a year, twice a day and we're gonna measure emergence at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. every day, come what may, right? So. We got two agronomists and uh, the rest of the engineers, and you know they don't. Sometimes I don't know what happens with them, but so we we go out, we we measure emergence twice a day. Uh, we then we go in and take so you know plant spacing, and then we dig out every single plant on all those strips. So all those treatments, three replications, one row from all or each of the row classifications for each treatment, so that I can look at data in terms of depth, spacing, emergence, and yield for all those row classifications for these treatments. Good. And then we go out pull years, we do some hand harvest, and we also do combine harvest yields as well. This was probably the first year we harvested every single plot we have planted with the exact same kind of you know, um, header width we needed to 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 harvest. So it was a big uh, achievement for our program because yield was something which was you know, you know, falling off the thing. Good. So with this background in mind, um, this is how you know, kind of a sample uh, thing looked like. And I want to point out you can look at any of these things uh, in terms of what the downforce things are. But picking up one row from wing, non-track and track, right? So all of those treatments. Uh, and we, we are looking at things in terms of what we want. All right. So, um, and all these maps. So what we have, we have, what we have done is so first one, so this slide, you're looking at point data, but the next two maps I'm going to show you 
is is showing all 12 rows of data plotted simultaneously so you can see you know row by row difference you know a little bit you know from a trend standpoint uh, what it was doing so um, this this is a field you can see that black solid line is uh, um, is our uh, is our area where we, we laid out strips. Um, you can see all the margin distribution. Those colors signify really, really well. So this is one way of saying that, hey, the planner toolbar or the system was able to implement and manage the margins you know, for all those treatments very well, right? The colors does signify. You guys see all these, right? Um, on the right side is the hydraulic pressure data. Um, you know, nothing to uh, just just to signify all that. So this is a map uh, where we are showing all twelve rows simultaneously. You can see, you know, row to row variability to a little, to a little bit from that extent. On the right, you are seeing the soil electrical conductivity, and you can also see the uh, the dotted black line. You know, so. We have some sort of a soil mix, but this is this is a reality in every single field in terms of what you do. So this is what we lay out in terms of opening disk load um, from what the soil variability says, and uh, you know how the individual rows were responding in terms of how much uh, disk load which we're taking. The beauty in terms of when you're looking at uh, disk loads are they can take up anywhere between 100 to 500 pounds or more, right? Um, and I think if you have if you have a field, I have lots of examples I can show you. Go to a certain field which has some history to it. You know, you were doing some work where you're storing stuff, you're building stuff, stuff that used to be a manufacturing facility. You will see that the amount of disk load in that area could be exponentially high. It means like if every the average on the field is 205, 200. 300 pounds on that area, it could be five, 600 pounds. So that is what it can easily show you. Some of these numbers are easily visible when your planter is going over the pivot tracks as well, right? So, um, so that is that is the beauty of uh, looking from that standpoint. Um, again, um, just just uh, looking at a margin uh, from from all row by row standpoint, and then row unit acceleration. So we haven't, we, I'm not gonna show you much on that, but what we have been, um, one of our bigger uh, objective was to look at how does the wider toolbars, you know, behave. So nothing more beyond that point. What you are seeing in this plot is an acceleration data coming from row unit 11, an acceleration data which is coming from row unit 23. Right, something which is on the wing and something which is in the middle. So all those black dots are from from a row unit which was 11, and then all those green dots are, you know, from uh, from row unit 23. And then all this red line is a speed. You can see it is going from five, seven and a half, and ten miles, and so on and so forth. What do you guys see in this plot? Right, but green dots are definitely on a wider bandwidth than the black. So that is the whole idea we were like trying to look at is that, you know, which row units are giving you tighter variance in in vertical acceleration versus the other ones. So there's definitely something. So this planter does have wing downforce on that too, right? So even after having that, we do see some sort of a variability from that standpoint. Good. So, so this is this is one thing we we we, we would like to say. Um, the other thing, like so, two things which are two or three things which are most important or critical for us. How does depth consistency, you know, pan out in terms of all these treatments, right? So, what you are seeing on this is an average. So, you combine all speeds for each margin, and where do you see in terms of depth? So, it goes. The scale goes. So these are my 100, 175, 250, and 350. And your depth goes like that. Zero on the top, three and a half inches on the bottom. What are you going to select if, if this is what the result is? Which margin you think works out best? So to give you another very quick uh, um, speech on this, we are we are trying to understand how best of the depth consistency you can get, right? In past years, we have, um, you know, when you go out and start, people have collected depth data in the field by hand. Anybody who has done that? Yes. 
uh, I'm can tell you measuring seed depth before or after planting is probably by far the most difficult thing to do in cone planting, right? So we have done everything from what we could do, right? Um, we used to fight that, oh, you know, maybe not each um, disc is equally worn out, right? Maybe our T-handle setting was not right. Maybe when we were setting our planter in the field, it was not exactly two inches. Or when people go out and they do not follow the same protocol, right? Uh, a lot of things can happen. And uh, this is very natural. This year, we our goal was that only two people will go out and measure depth. And I'm not kidding. If you segregate data from those two people, even after having a whole session, we have same digital calipers, we have same protocol, their data looks slightly different. Right? Human nature, you know, how you measure those things. But we wanted to negate everything from our own ability, like brand new planter, Every row unit was set right using set and seed, you know, thing. Have you guys heard about that? I can set every every row unit, you know, accurately. Uh, and then, you know, T-handle settings are right. We use exact same calipers to, to measure depth right after planting so that we know our planter was set right. And then two people who follow the same protocol, right? Um, people calibrate every row unit here when you're setting. Yes, yes, you have to, right? Because... If you look at, so from our experience, brand new planter, all 24 rows were not on the same setting at T-handle. Do you guys, have you seen that or done that, know that? Yeah. So lots of row units have lots of different settings if you really want to achieve two inch depth. So one thing you want to take home is that you need, I will, or we all will calibrate every single row unit individually because I cannot rely on one T-handle setting for all the row units, even from a brand new system. Guys, want to take home this message? Yes? Okay. Uh, yeah. Say it again. Yeah. Two inch. Two inch was the goal. Yes, two inch was the goal. So from all our previous work, we have seen that. So we are particularly talking about green system here. Please do not mix this work with any other work because there are slightly different things, right? And the other thing I want to say is it is all about how consistent I can maintain margin. Please remember this line. How consistently I can maintain margin on my system. If I can do that, things will change, right? So somehow on this system, it seems like, so we've been preaching for a couple of years that you should start somewhere around 180, 200 pounds of margin. And then you should see, you know, you know, depth, how does depth look like? How does your ride quality looks like? And dial in a little bit more, right? I have seen a lot of people who continue to dial back and forth. Please don't do that. That's not helpful, right? You know, when you sit down in the, in the cab, just trust the system. So, um, so in this case, we, what we see that 250 pound margin is probably giving you the best depth, right? You can see the 350, 25 pound margin as well, but there is a lot of variability as well. The faster you're moving, the more margin you have, whenever your row unit is going to hit any hard spot, it's going to go up, you know, equally faster as well. Plus all the wear and tear we are talking about, right? So 250 pound margin is definitely the uh, what we looked at in terms of the, the the quality of that part is now if you see all the distribution individually from speed combinations and all that stuff i do not know what happened here um in this case when we were looking at the uh, uh, the 325 and how much variability in depth this was but uh, again seven and a half at seven and a half mile speed 250 pound margin again so when you look at 10 miles, even then, I'm pretty close in terms of, you know, what I can get on that margin, um, you know, in terms of um, the consistency of depth part of it. Now, what, so if you want to, so the idea is what can we learn, you know, in terms of um, the consistency of the depth part of it, speed combination. And if we combine all the things we can measure and all the things which are available for us to, to read about it, two things come to my mind, to our mind from what we have learned. One, if I can consistently monitor how tight my margin maintenance is, right? So what is happening is at 100, 100 pounds, my variance is quite high. 
If my variance is quite high, I'm gonna continue to jump around in terms of depth. You know, at 75, it kind of a closes, but 250 pound is when it really kind of a narrows down. The system is really nice. It is, you know, kind of a zoned in and give me a nice, you know, margin consistency. And if you are maintaining good margin, will my ride quality be very good? Yes. How many people think if I can maintain my margin really well, my ride quality should be really good as well, right? So, so if if I can use one data layer to see that my margin consistencies are there, and as a complementary data layer saying my ride quality is good as well, I can somehow automate the system for my producers, you know, so that they don't have to worry about when they are moving across speeds and different soils, right? So that is where you know this this thing comes up that. Um, that 250 pound and seven and a half mile is, is really good. Now, again, I'm saying do not take that, that you need 250 pound for all other systems too, right? It may be that some other systems are really good, you know, maintaining 160 pounds, 150 pound margin all the time. You may get good depth consistency with those systems, but here, this is a sweet spot. Questions? This is John Deere system. Yes. Yes. Well, we'll see that. We haven't gotten to that point yet. Yes. Hold on. Hold on. Train is getting there. All right. So I guess this is where everybody is eager to, to look at some of those things. Before we go there, I also, also want to show you all the data we have from all 12 rows, right? Um, because we were getting data from every alternate row from a from a, a machine data standpoint. And what do you see from this data? So again, this plot shows all planter row, alternate planter, planter row units from one to twenty-three and depth on the on the y-axis, zero on the top, two and a half. This solid dotted line is what my goal is. And these two dotted lines, if I say if I'm within quarter of an inch margin. I'm fine, right? If I'm in a good, decent moisture zone, uh, I can tell from nine years of planner work at K-State, we, except for 2022, um, when we have really, really dry season, we were just waiting to actually get some rains. Usually we get a lot of rains in the beginning and we are waiting for the, for the, uh, for the fields to dry up a little bit. And we do get very good rains right after planting. So we have a really good moisture all the time. I don't know, something we, you know. so, so what are you guys seeing? We, we have a couple of things to cover really quick. Right, so all, 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 this is 12 rows. I don't know about the all other 24 rows if we combine everything else. So there is some inconsistency in terms of, you know, for the depth management part of it. So what we did this year, we, we brought all the data we have, you know, yes, there are only 5,000 plants, but 5,000 plants is a lot of data, right? I'm not talking about 50, 5,000 is a pretty big data, you know, uh, data pool. So we brought all the data uh, along with speed, along with Mars and all that stuff. And we thought, okay, we're gonna do some, some more data analysis beyond that one, right? So there's something called response surface methodology in, in statistics, machine learning standpoint. And we thought, okay, we're gonna go out and find you know, um, how do the, these rows behave if we, look, if we look at from a row classification standpoint, right? So um, the behavior of non-track rows is on the left. The behavior of the track rows is in the middle and the behavior on the wing rows is on the right. Everybody with me on that? So pretty linear response, you know, if I look at non-track rows and more like a, Parabolic thing, you know, um, quadratic you know, from a from a track, and then wing rows are just by themselves. Pretty weird in terms of how they behave. And what we see, if you, I don't know whether people can see in the back the numbers below, but we are looking at if you if you really want to achieve two inch depth, the target margin needed by each row classification was different, right? So if I if I if I pull out this thing that seven miles and two inch depth on this thing, all of these dotted red lines go to a different point on the y-axis. Everybody's paying attention on that part, 
right? So, so this is what it is uh, kind of a promote, you know, kind of pushing us to to talk more and more about is that if we want to set a planter for one type of a margin, there will be some rows which may not have the true margin they need to get me two inch depth, right? The other thing is, do we really need two inch, two inch? Because every 0.1 inch depth achievement takes a significant amount of more margin to get there, right? So if you're good that if you want to plan two inch depth, you're okay with 1.8, 1 1.85 1 to 9, 1.9, you are in a decent different spot than versus you say, I exactly want two inch every time I, I'm, you know, for my breed seed. True. Absolutely true. Yes. Yep. I so so what is the expectation on emergence here? What do you guys achieve from a system? Are we talking no till? Or are we talking, you know, um, till fields? <laughs> yes, it doesn't matter from a farmer standpoint, but it will change the dynamics if you are in the no till versus till thing, right? From our exp you know, from our experience from all those years, I have never or we have never seen even three days of full emergence, right? So yes, ideally you can get into the 95 plus spot range in the, in the under three days range if, if everything has gone well, um, including good moisture and, and all that stuff, right? So quickly finishing up, um, this is another another um, learning, you know, we are trying to see, okay, how do we, how do we manage all that? The other takeaways we have is that for every one mile increase in operating speed, you need to tack on additional margin to continue to maintain your depth. So if I'm planning five miles or I'm planning six miles, whatever margin works for me, if I start planning faster by a mile, I need to add some margin because otherwise you're gonna start losing some depth. Is that kind of obvious? Yes, we do understand that higher speed starts to lose something, right? But if we, if I if I set one margin and start to plan faster, I have to add some more margin to make sure that I can, my, my consistency on depth is there, right? All right, so one is that unique row classification in another seven and a half mile is definitely the most responsive speed. That is another thing which is which was pretty amazing. That seven and a half mile speed was most responsive to addition in margin to achieve more consistency in depth. Some other speeds do not as much, right? So any questions on that part? There are systems in the market actually where you need to set different margins for different row classification. So it's not something, you know, completely out of the blue as well. All right. So uh, talking about emergence, right, from everybody, for us as well, emergence was number one thing, you know, to, to look at how it goes. Um, this year, 2023 was very unique from a couple of things. One, um, we, the moment we planted, we had a cold spell for the next two and a half weeks. Uh, we get some nice rains, but the temperatures were like hovering around low 60s to mid 60s, right? So that is why you will see that the emergence is kind of a, you know, delayed emergence for a long time. The, the other thing uh, I want to mention is that we drew a line at certain, we wanted to draw a line at a certain point, right? So we thought that at 84 hours from first plant emerged in that field, we're gonna draw a line and see where we are on emergence because we have to draw a line at a certain point because otherwise if you want to go 100%, it's like forever because of the cold spell and all that. So, uh, wait, I we have I can show you all the thing, but this is specifically for seven and a half mile. And what you will see is this is hundred pound. This is uh, this is hundred pound. Uh, so this is hundred pound margin emergence. Everybody watch it. I'm gonna slide it down. This is hundred and seventy five. This is two hundred and fifty. And this is. 325, right? So let's roll back one more time. 100 pounds, 175, 250, and 325, right? You did see, we all saw that, you know, there's a shift in emergence towards right as we start to add more and more margin on that part, right? But again, if we see 
So go back and this time all you want to see is the number here, right? After my 84 hour emergence line, right? So 94% emergence, 94% emergence, 96% emergence, 93% emergence. Is it something which is really standing out that you don't want to see? Pretty close to each other, right? There's not much of a difference. They are they are a day apart from what it is, you know, but it's not that I am in the 70s range or all that range. So one thing, this was very, I don't know, they, we, you know, um, um, we we are dead set on understanding these these two things, high margin and emergence effect and then high margin and yield impact, right? So how do they, how do they correlate? So um, if you see all that, if you combine different speeds, if, it com if I combine all the margins, there's not a whole lot of a difference at 84 hours. I mean, I'm not talking about everything else. It just drew a line around that point, uh, except for this 325 pound and 10 mile, which is kind of outlier. Everybody was, and this 100 pound as well, again, too much high speed and too little high speed. Everything else was in the same ballpark in terms of emergence. Good. Okay. Um, so this is a yield comparison. This is again, this is a hand harvested yield. And I want to confess that we dig out all the seeds very gently, although agronomists will contend and I'm, I'm with them that you know, it may impact or it does impact my plant. And we put every plant back in and then we hand harvest all the yields. Now, granted, this data was true for all the treatments, right? I'm not doing anything for one treatment, not doing for other treatments. So this is where the, the yield stands. Um, and it is, it is also an outlier where you see that 325 pound yield was somewhat higher than this. But if you see some of those things, uh, seems like in in the in the 250 pound margin, this yield was significantly lower for some reason. I don't know what happened here, right? Maybe when people were digging out plants and putting them back in, they didn't do a good job. 3 p.m. in the afternoon, they're tired, you know, too hot, didn't have water, didn't have food. I don't know what was going on. But this is what happened, you know, so this one outlier pulled the yield for the entire 250 pound margin below, you know, or down from that standpoint. But if we see all other things, they were hanging out there, right? So both emergence and yield doesn't have a whole lot of a difference. If we see the combine yield, so what we do, we have a 500 foot um, or feet, you know, kind of a pass. And we, this data is only 17, 17 and a half feet strip. Right. So if I flip all that data, it does represent exactly what you're seeing here. Although the yield difference is somewhere between 50, 20 bushel because of the impact of when I dig all those individual plants and put them back in, they have an impact on final year. How does it, the, 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 the yield looks like? Questions? I think I, I didn't quite understand the graphs. So yeah. So what these graphs are telling you is, so yeah, my bad. Um, downforce margin here. So sorry for the kilogram, but this is 100, 175, 250, and 325. And on this thing, this is cone yield, right? And this is all combining, you know, from, from a standpoint of, so everything at five mile, everything at seven and a half mile, everything at 10 miles. Right. So, and then all these margins up, up above, they are saying whether they are significant or not significant. If there is NS that is no, not significant, everything which has a star has a significant difference in yield between those combinations. So for example, if you take this, these are significant, these are significant, these are significant, this and this is significant, this and this is significant. That makes sense. Five miles is lower, then they're saying that I should be at a, a less of a margin. Right. You do pretty good at five miles. Absolutely. Spot on. 
it is all about when you start you know planning faster you know what type of margin your system is capable of maintaining most of the time it should not continue to move around all the time it should stay in a small tight variance that's the end of that's one line answer on how good my system is and where should i be keeping my margin when i'm planning at certain speeds no exactly there are certain planters where you can maintain 140 pound 150 pound margin and you can get the same results all right good we need to discuss we need to see a few more things here um seed localization so a couple of years back we have done we have developed the system um, at k-state from just you know student-led projects um it's a it's a seed localization system which means that you know i can i have a camera i have a laser line scanner it's a it's a sensor from bomber it gives me what it does is it's a lots of you know uh infrared light and then it gives me a profile of the entire trench it doesn't give me a depth but it looks at the deepest point and it looks at the shallowest point and give me a difference so i can see what the depth is and what we have seen from you know tests and all that you can maintain the, the error margin in terms of measuring depth by hand and by the sensor is somewhere around like a, a quarter of an inch and a little bit more right um but what it can do is it can go and 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 measure it can it can look at the trench it can look at individual seeds so um we've done a lot of things in terms of learning and model development and all that but i think this is of what is of interest to you is that when the seed is planted, you know going in the trench i can see every single seed which is being placed in the trench um we can run this system now up to 50 frames per second real time uh, i can give you the total number of seeds planted at any given time uh, what was the average seed to seed spacing what was the what was the singulation how many doubles how many how many misses on the go right uh, what else would we want to learn from that part is that how many seeds are placed in the middle of the trench and how many seeds are placed towards a side wall or somewhat got large on the side how many times do you see some sort of a trash right some sort of trash is okay it might be just organic matter but some other straw or trash might be something which might be detrimental right it may impact my seed to soil contact emergence and all that stuff so that is the goal and then you saw that the, this model stopped at the loss so it can only do eight frames per second right so this is this is an older slide you see the 25 frame per second but you know in the next phase now we are up to 50 frames per second real time and and you can get all that data it's just fun to see you know what what you see in the furrow right uh the idea about developing this was multiple fold one we want to do something which is real time analytics right you know some of our guys are sick and tired of going out and digging 5000 seeds every year right um they have a little canopy they they drag around with them and you sit in the field and you dig and see and you drag around a canopy and dig you know all that stuff so the other thing it limits our ability to capture data for how much area we can capture data on uh and then the um the other thing is this also gave you the GPS location of every single seed you have planted. So now if you start to see some basic, you know, long misses and all, I can go back into specific spots and look at what happened there, right? Maybe you want to manage, you know, weed, you know, management in a different way. Uh, operator confidence is another thing. I can do some other things, but most, you know, important thing is I can tie all this information back to my control system and not have operator worried about making changes for himself or herself right if i see my singulation changes i can i can work with vacuum i can work with margin i can work with a lot of things because this is true measurement it's not an indirect measurement for certain type of a thing right the other thing i want to show talk about a little bit just a just a teaser kind of a thing uh, we want we want to understand how the how much is the row cleaner you know systems are on air seeders um we have a, a, you know a row cleaners which are just the same way for many many years uh, and also, it is also complementing our work, uh, you know, for for looking at the trench quality and all that. So, really, um, some really good, uh, um, you know, uh, thing to look at. You know, on any image, you know, you can do all that thing. 
I think um, we are at a point that we can run a video and, and do this kind of work at 10 frames per second or more. But, uh, but more importantly, what we want to do is you look at any kind of an image and we want to give you some metrics on it. it means how much area was covered with full straw, how much area was has some, some loose straw, how much was fluff. It's not straw, you know, but it is not soil as well, but maybe organic matter and all, and how much was soil. So uh, even some blurred images, you know, things which has some straw, some has more soil versus straw, some things, some straw bunches and, and more blurry things. So um, we're really excited about this part this year. We, we, we are lots of, uh, lots of computer vision uh, related um, kind of a knowledge development for engineers and agronomists to see, okay, how those systems are doing and what is happening behind the, the planters and air seeders. So we want to thank uh, USDNFI and John Deere. And, and this is my email address, my Twitter, which I do not do too much, but Farms Lab, uh, I want to say Farms Lab is, is, is our group. Um, so if you want to go to farmslab.kstate.edu, you can see our team and what different types of things we do. So uh, there's an email to reach out to us. We'll be more than happy if you have questions or ideas for us to include in 2024. So thank you for your time, and I will take some questions. We have time for a couple of questions. Any comments or questions for Dr. Shawdway here? All right. So yes. What type of round would this planter use on this? Here in a while, we got clay, we got sand, we got you know everything in between. This type of going. So we have done these things on most most of most type of soils. Typically, our soils are sandy loam to clay loam thing. Uh, we we do not have either too light or too heavy soils. So can I call these soil like medium soils? Is that what it falls in? Very, 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 very yeah. Right. Yep. Lots of moisture, like I said, lots of terraces. Um, we learned a lot of things about this year about if you are planting with these kind of toolbars on terraces and how much open trenches you can leave and um, yeah, lots, lots of things which can impact that. Yes, sir. Uh, no -till or like I said, every single field in nine years is no-till, right? Only one year, one field, you know, the farmer has hog manure and we have to go out and, you know, work a little bit. But other than that, it is, there are no-till for 20 years, 30 years, things of that nature. Uh, some, but very, very few, like I said, if there was a cover crop, we would have planted one year in wheat or milo or residue or something. But like I said, almost all of our field somehow has been all wheat, so corn, soy, you know, rotation. True field conditions, we go in, we, we actually these, all of those fields are within farmers' uh, production system. And um, it, it's a lot of responsibility that, you know, both from a timing standpoint and also to make sure that we put the seed in the right way for him. Uh, that all that is the only thing which is giving us flexibility to go out and, and get the fields we need. So, yes, everything, everything production acre standpoint. Thank you, everyone. If you still have more. Couple, couple housekeeping notes. Apologies for the you know, I was thinking about some of your questions or comments or anything, but if I kind of put the two presentations together, I guess we got some uh, advancements to make. Number one, what we're learning is there's going to be more technology coming for your planners. We know that for a fact. We've seen it. If you go to Agrotechnica, you'll see it. It's just coming. We're going to learn more. Secondly, though, the challenge was if we think about yield monitoring technology, there's no way you're going to be able to go out and, and do some of these studies as what he mentioned, you know, understanding row by row variability, if not sections of the plan or variability, we can't do that today with yield monitors. So we got, even as academics and industry, we're going to have to overcome that because if we know where every seed is and we can just characterize the, you know, the conditions in which that seed was placed, we don't know, right? We don't, we today are unable to evaluate that effectively, in my opinion. And so we've got some, some things to overcome that bring technology to the forefront to allow us to look at a row by row or meter by meter or whatever that needs to be in order to do some of this, to enable you, Paul, to do some of the things I think you're probably thinking about sitting there. So just kind of bring it. Um, we're done with the morning session. We'll be back at 1.15. So we're at lunch right now. 
We'll be back in this room at 1.15. We're going to transition and talk about pulse width technology and ultimately driver conversation at Targeted Spring. That'll be the afternoon session. Uh, if you haven't or are interested, we've got a couple things in the back, the E-Fields report and E-Barnes report. If you haven't got yours, please pick those up. But with that, we'll adjourn for the morning, and we'll be back here at 1.15. Thanks, everyone.